Hello and thank you so much for joining us for today's video. We just want to show you a short clip from our video, Three Terrifying Haunted Bridges from our new channel, Paranormally Listed. Science is rich with proven examples that how certain animals have a sense that humans don't. Birds have been known to sense earthquakes. There are reports of cats cozying up to elderly people who are about to die. Even sea turtles have shown a keen connection to the Earth's electromagnetic force. So it may not be hard to leap to the idea that dogs perhaps have a sixth sense when it comes to the paranormal. Case in point, Overton Bridge, the West Dart Bardenshire, Scotland. Built in 1895 by industrialist James White as a traverse connecting his Gothic mansion to the town nearby. The stone bridge spans a deep ravine in a densely forested area. Yet, sadly, the ravine has become a wrestling place of countless pet canines over the years. So many dogs have died at the bridge, in fact, that has been dubbed the Dog Suicide Bridge by local townsfolk. You can find a link to the rest of the video and the channel in the description box below this video and at the end of this video. But just before we start today's video, we want to talk about our fantastic sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV adds new documentaries every week, and they already have a massive library. To find the documentaries they just added, all you have to do is go to their new releases section. That's where I found the miniseries, Who Killed Trudy Adams? In 1978, 18-year-old Trudy Adams went missing after attending a dance in Sydney, Australia. She was last seen hitchhiking home. She was never seen again. It's one of the most infamous missing person cases in Australian history. It's often referred to as Australia's Twin Peaks. I thought that the three-part series was absolutely riveting. I managed to binge watch it in one day. I highly recommend you check out this amazing series as well. It's just one of over 3,000 documentaries available on Magellan TV. I also really like their 4K documentaries because they are visually stunning. I also love Magellan TV because it's very easy to use. It's available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play, or just cast from your browser to your TV. Right now is the perfect time to check out Magellan TV because they are offering criminally listed viewers a month of free service. To get this amazing offer, go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed. So please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch and you'll be supporting criminally listed. Number 3. Leonard Bukikio In December 1980, 75-year-old Elwood Fugard on the Penn Classic Lanes Bowling Alley in Altoona, Pennsylvania. On December 7, 1980, at around 1 a.m., the police received a tip that they should go check out the bowling alley. Officers arrived at the bowling alley and found the dead body of Elwood Fugard. He had been struck in the head several times with a blunt object. The gas register was empty. Outside the alley, in a grassy area, the police found a 10-pound bowling ball, which was determined to be the murder weapon. The police started an investigation that lasted 19 months. The police eventually talked to the friends of Larry Bukikio, who was 17 at the time of the murder. On the night of the murder, Bukikio met four friends at a mall in Altoona. Then they got into one of their cars and drove around for a while. Just after 11 p.m., a young woman who was with them said she needed to call her mother to let her know where she was. They drove up to the bowling alley, but the young woman didn't want to go into the alley alone. So 17-year-old Bukikio went inside with her. She asked the store's owner, Edward Fagard, if she could use the phone. Fagard took her to a room behind the counter, then he returned to the main area where he was alone with Bukikio. The young woman called home, but there was no answer. She walked out of the room and made her way to the alley door. That's when she saw Bukikio throw a bowling ball at Fagard's head. She then saw Bukikio pick up the ball, raise it over his head, and bring it down towards Fugard's head. The young woman left the alley and got into the car. Based on the medical report, it's known that Bukikio struck Fugard several more times in the head with a bowling ball. 
Okikyo exited the bowling alley a few minutes after the young woman had got into the car. He told his friends that he had killed someone. He then counted the money he had stolen, which was $73, which is about $250 in 2022. He offered to split the money with the other four people in the car. None of them took the money. The police already knew who Leonard Bukikio was. In January 1982, Bukikio and his stepfather were arrested for robbing a store in February 1981. Bukikio and his stepfather were suspects in 50 other armed robberies in 17 counties. So in July 1982, when Bukikio was charged with Elwood Fregard's murder, he was already in jail awaiting trial for armed robbery. Leonard Bukikio went to trial for first degree murder in April 1983. The jury spent just three hours deliberating. Bukikio was found guilty of first degree murder. The sentence came with a mandatory life sentence. 29 years later, the United States Supreme Court ruled that mandatory life sentences for people who committed crimes under the age of 18 were unconstitutional. Four years later, the ruling was made retroactive. So this made Bukikio eligible for a new sentencing hearing. In April 2018, Bukikio was sentenced to a minimum of 35 years to life plus an additional two to four years for the robbery charges. Leonard Bukikio was paroled in April 2020 at the age of 56. He had served with 37 years in prison. Number two, Glendon Winninger. In early 1995, 40-year-old Glendon Winninger lived with her 37-year-old boyfriend, Steve Detmer, in an apartment in Bloomington, Indiana. Detmer owned a bowling supply company. On January 4th, 1985, Winger called 911 because Detmer needed medical attention. When first responders arrived, Detmer was lying on the couch in the living room in front of the TV. He was unconscious and it was clear he had suffered massive head injuries. There was a bowling ball next to the couch. Detmer was rushed to the hospital, but the 37-year-old died the next day. Winninger was interviewed by the police and she admitted that while Detmer slept in front of the TV, she repeatedly dropped a 14-pound bowling ball on his head. But she claimed that she never wanted to kill him. Winninger said that the problem was that Detmer was abusive. She thought if she hit him in the head a few times, he'd understand how much it hurt and he would stop hitting her in the head. Winninger was arrested and charged with murder. Leonard Winninger went to trial in June 1985. The prosecution argued that Winninger killed Detmer with forethought and malice. They said that Winninger had learned that the night before his death, he had been out with another woman. The prosecution said that Winninger's actions were those of a jealous lover. The defense argued that Winninger suffered from battered wife syndrome. It was the first time the defense was allowed to be used in Indiana. The defense had several people testify who saw Winninger with bruises and cuts. They also testified about how Detmer mentally abused her. Detmer's ex-wife came from California to testify. She said that Detmer was horribly abusive to her and twice she filed assault and battery charges against him. She said that she was constantly in fear of her life. He told her that if she ever left him, he would kill her. One time when she did leave, he appeared at the motel where she was staying and stole her clothes and property. However, the judge did not allow the jury to hear Detmer's ex-wife's testimony. The prosecution also argued that if Detmer was abusive against Winninger, why weren't there any medical or police records? The defense said that Winninger was financially and emotionally dependent on Detmer 
so she couldn't go to the police or the hospital. The trial lasted for five days. The jury of seven men and five women deliberated for ten hours. They found Glendon Winninger not guilty of murder, but they did find her guilty of voluntary manslaughter. The conviction came with a possible sentence of up to 20 years of prison. At the sentencing hearing, the judge revealed he had received 50 letters from abused women from around the country asking for the sentence to be suspended. The defense also presented a petition signed by 130 people in Bloomington requesting the same thing. The judge acknowledged that Detmer abused Winninger. But he said that if Detmer were convicted of abusing Winninger, he would not have received the death penalty. So therefore, he could not condone Winninger's actions. He sentenced her to eight years in prison and she would be able to transfer to a community correction program after some time. The judge did not specify how much time she needed to spend in prison before she could transfer to the program. So it's unclear how much time Winninger spent in prison. Glennon Winninger passed away in February 2011 at the age of 66. Number 1. Calvin Settle In February 1994, 43-year-old Santos Riviera and his 41-year-old wife, Donna Riviera, were both psychotherapists at Maumadies Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. The couple had two children, Santos Jr., who was three, and Italia, who was eight months old. The family shared a house with a couple in Allenville, New York, and their primary residence was in Jersey City, New Jersey. On February 6, 1994, the family was driving home in their 1991 Audi station wagon. They drove through the Holland Tunnel into Jersey City. They were about a mile from the tunnel and they were approaching an overpass. Suddenly, they saw something fall about 15 to 20 feet from the overpass. He hit the fender of a transport truck driving in the opposite direction and then bounced into their lane. The object smashed into their windshield. The Rivieras thought that whatever hit their car bounced off the windshield. They managed to pull over about a quarter of a mile from the overpass. That's when they made a horrifying discovery. The object that struck their windshield was a 16-pound Brunswick bowling ball. It had then smashed through the back window of their car. It then struck 8-month-old Natalia in the head. No one else in the car was harmed. The baby was rushed to the hospital. But tragically, nothing could be done for Natalia. She was pronounced dead a few hours after arriving at the hospital. The police examined the bowling ball and saw that the name Mike was inscribed in it. They thought it might be a clue. But then, about 48 hours after the death, the police received a phone call from a caseworker who worked in a residential program for young people with emotional problems. She said she overheard one of the youths she worked with, 18-year-old Calvin Settle, talking about the bowling ball incident on the phone. Settle lived in Jersey City, just a few blocks from where Natalia was struck with the bowling ball. Settle was brought in to the police station for questioning that night. Settle explained that he and two friends, one who was 12 and another who was 11, had been at his apartment. A glass frame photograph of NBA legend Michael Jordan had crashed to the floor and it broke. They cleaned it up and took the debris outside to the trash. They found the bowling ball in the dumpster. They started rolling the ball and eventually they made their way to the overpass. Settle said that he rested the ball on the barrier of the overpass and it accidentally fell. He later told the police that he was standing on the barrier and the ball slipped from his hands. The police talked with Settle's two friends and they said that Settle came up with the idea of throwing the ball onto the highway. They said that he intentionally threw the ball over the barrier at a car. 
Calvin Settle was arrested and charged with aggravated manslaughter. 19-year-old Calvin Settle went to trial in February 1995. He was looking at 30 years of prison. The trial lasted about 10 days and the jury deliberated for two days. Settle was found guilty of a lesser charge of reckless manslaughter. In April 1995, he was given the maximum sentence of 10 years of prison. After their daughter's death, the Riviera's press for fencing to be put up on overpasses. Santos Riviera said, The most important message is that we're all vulnerable to this kind of senseless crime and is preventable. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.